Nikki Strong, and this is VOA One, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear stories from Andrew Smith, John Russell, Katie Weaver, and Faith Perlow. Andrew's story discusses a new plan in the U.S. to build electric vehicle charging stations along the highways in all 50 states. John's story tells about a new food center in New York City where you can try many different meals from Singapore. Katie brings us information about how drought is affecting elephants and a rare kind of zebra in Kenya. And if you are a fan of fashion and movies from the 1950s and 1960s, Faith has a story about a new Marilyn Monroe film you will not want to miss. After that, you will hear my higher education report about some high-tech study programs that should be interesting for students wishing to come to universities in the U.S. And finally, our program comes to a close with Ana Mateo's words and their stories. You might say... Today's episode was all over the map. And now, here's Andrew Smith. The U.S. Department of Transportation recently approved plans for all 50 American states to build charging stations for electric vehicles, or EVs, along the nation's highways. The network of charging stations is part of the government's efforts to help more Americans move to zero-emission vehicles. The approval means that $5 billion in federal money will be available over five years to build the stations. They will be placed about every 80 kilometers along the highways. The goal is to have about 500,000 charging stations across the nation. And construction of the stations could begin by spring of 2023. Under the Department of Transportation rules, states must first build fast charging stations that could cost between $40,000 to $100,000. A vehicle can fully charge at these stations in about one hour. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg said, America led the original automotive revolution in the last century. And he said the plan will help make sure people in every part of the country will be able to use electric vehicles. President Biden has set a goal that 50% of new U.S. car sales be electric by 2030. The charging network is a big step to help Americans worry less about finding a place to charge their electric vehicles. But it could be difficult for some states to deal with limited electricity grid capacity and shortages of materials to build the stations. States like Texas, California, and Florida say their electricity grid should be able to handle an increase of a million or more EVs. Other states like New Jersey, Vermont, and Mississippi are not so sure. They also expressed concerns about whether they could set up charging stations that meet the American-made rules. 
It may delay implementation by several years, New Jersey officials wrote. Currently, many EV owners charge their vehicles at home, about 80% of the time, usually at single family houses. But that is likely to change with the new charging network. The new law also gives an extra $2.5 billion to rural areas and poorer communities to help build charging stations in those places. I'm Andrew Smith. For the first time, a Singapore-style cooked food center has opened in New York. It brings flavors from the Southeast Asian island's mix of Malay, Chinese, Indian, and other cultures to an American food court. Urban Hawker, in Midtown Manhattan, has 17 food cellars that were chosen by K.F. Sito, the food center's curator. Eleven of the sellers come directly from Singapore. Each seller has a well-known dish, such as crab chili, oyster omelette, Hainanese chicken rice, or nasi lemak, a rice dish. Sito said, I came across Singaporeans who had been living in the United States in New York for like twenty, thirty, thirty-five years, and they still miss Singapore food. He added, Street food in Singapore is not something you burn or deep-fry. It's fairly complex. They take six hours just to prepare a meal to get it ready at 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. The idea for the food hall was born when Sito met the famous U.S. cook Anthony Bourdain in 2013 at a street food event in Singapore. Bourdain liked the idea of a cooked food center, also called a Hawker Center, in New York. Sito later discussed the idea with Eldon Scott, president of Urban Space. Scott, a property manager who curates public markets, quickly agreed. The amazing thing about him saying yes was that he's never been to Singapore, Sito said. Sito hopes that this Hawker Center will be the first of many in the U.S., It's just like exporting grandmother's deliciousness, the food that I grew up with, he said. Magdalene Sim, a Singaporean, said on social media about the new Hawker Center, Food was good, but something was missing without plastic plates, cutlery, and sweltering heat. Sweltering is a term that means very hot. Sim added that the lines of people were the same, though. Julie Lee on her third visit, praised Hainan Jones's chicken over rice. Everyone should give it a try. So much flavor, so tender, she said. I'm John Russell. Kenya's worst dry weather in 40 years has killed almost 2% of the world's rarest zebra in three months. Over the same period, 25 times more elephants died than usual as well. The drought is starving Kenya's famed wildlife of usual food sources and driving them closer to population centers. The ever-widening search for food can result in deadly conflict between animals and people. Without interventions to protect wildlife or rain, animals in many parts of the East African country could face a crisis, conservationists say. 
It's a serious threat to us, said Andrew Latura, an animal observation officer at Grievy's Zebra Trust. The Grievy's Zebra is larger than a standard plains zebra and has narrower stripes and wider ears. They are the rarest of zebra species. Just 3,000 remain in the world, 2,500 of which are in Kenya. Drought has killed about 40 grievies since June, which is how many would be expected to die over a whole year, said Latura. He spoke to Reuters at the Samburu National Reserve in northern Kenya. If we are losing 40 within three months, what would that mean to the remaining population, he asked. GZT has begun to feed Grievy's zebras hay poured over a mix of molasses, salt, and calcium, helping to reduce the number of deaths, the trust says. The situation in southern Kenya is also bad. Rangers have counted eight times as many animals dead or too weak to stand compared to a normal September. The Amboseli Trust for Elephants have recorded 50 elephants dead or missing, said Benson Leyen, the chief of Big Life Foundation. The group works with local landowners to protect conservation areas and open rangelands of the Amboseli ecosystem. In the Kittenden Conservancy nearby, the smell from dead animals is strong. It sometimes leads visitors to wear face covers, a conservancy officer said. Some wild animals are dying at the hands of people. We're seeing a five-fold increase in incidents of people poaching for bushmeat as compared to other dry seasons, Lei Yin said. Another group, Save the Elephants, said it is finding a growing number of animals killed by guns or spears, but with their tusks in place. The tusks are what poachers sell. So experts say these elephant deaths were due to conflict with local people, not poaching. The crisis is not the result of drought alone, experts say. Large numbers of farm animals are eating up rangelands, said David DeBalin, field operations chief for Save the Elephants. He added that the lack of grasses makes it harder for ecosystems to recover from drought. The next usual seasonal rains are from October through November. Latura of GZT does not want to think of the possibility that the rain might not come. The situation is already bad, but that would make it a serious crisis he said. The first words anyone says now is that they are praying for rain. I'm Katie Weaver. Marilyn Monroe was a famous American movie actress from the 1950s and early 1960s. Her life is being detailed in a new movie on Netflix, Blonde. It stars Ana de Armas as Marilyn Monroe. Monroe was well known for her costumes in the movies. She wore a bright pink long dress to sing the song Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend. And most famously, she wore a white dress that blew up as she walked over the subway in the movie The Seven-Year Itch. The costumes have been talked about in popular culture. They have been recreated 
and reimagined many times in Hollywood movies and even in low cost clothing shops. In 2011, the famous white dress that Monroe wore was bought for $4.6 million. And a copy of the dress went for $120,000 several years later. That explains why Jennifer Johnson felt a lot of pressure to get the costumes just right for the movie Blonde. As costume designer for the movie, Johnson was not able to study Monroe's costumes in person. Johnson and her team watched films, looked at photos, and used information from a book by William Trevia, who was responsible for Monroe's famous looks. Even though the team could not use the same materials to make the costumes for Blonde, Johnson said it was important that the structure of the dresses was similar, so that they would not look like low-priced copies. She had read in Trevia's book about problems that happened with the dresses. For example, when the pink dress was not moving correctly, when Monroe walked down the stairs in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, Trevia used green felt, a material usually found on pool tables to support the dress. While Johnson did not use the same pool table material as Trevia, she understood the issue and recreated the dress with new material. Johnson said that it is always easier to make new clothes than to find something old. It's quite hard to find existing things, she said. The most difficult one to recreate was, of course, the white dress from the seven-year itch. The dress has many pleats in which the material is folded over itself. It needs a special structure that few places can make anymore. Johnson said it took about 45 meters of material for her team to recreate the white dress because of problems with the pleats. It was incredible how much fabric it took to create the arc and the drama of that dress when it blows up with the subway grate, she said. But in the end, it was worth creating that special moment. It's so beautifully shot by Chase Irvin, our amazing cinematographer, Johnson said. Monroe's everyday style was more casual. Johnson and Andrew Dominic, the director, dressed Ana de Armas as Monroe with capri pants that are cut off just below the knee, and sweaters. Some of the pieces were old clothes found in Los Angeles costume houses. Johnson wanted the clothes to be as natural as possible to fit de Armas's body and to be understood by modern movie watchers. Johnson then added, Those dresses are so iconic. They could easily overtake the actor and become all about the costume. And I always wanted it to be complimentary to Anna's incredible performance. I'm Faith Perlow. International students who come to the United States often study science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, also known as STEM. Not as many come for programs in humanities or the arts, the 2021 Open Doors report says. Under U.S. laws, after finishing school, 
international students are permitted to work in the country for one year under the Optional Practical Training, or OPT, program. For STEM students, the program extends their work permit for an additional two years in their field of study. The U.S. Immigration Office publishes the STEM Designated Degree Program list for study programs that it considers for the OPT extension. The programs include new technologies using engineering, mathematics, computer science, or natural sciences, including physical, biological, and agricultural sciences. But international students who are interested in business, psychology, news reporting, and even theater should know that more study programs in the U.S. are coming to the list. Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts, is currently looking for students for a STEM-designated journalism program that will start in one year. The program will offer a Master of Science degree in Media Innovation and Data Communication. Students will take classes such as Telling Your Story with Data and Digital Journalism. John Wibby teaches journalism and media innovation at Northeastern. He said, Today's journalists need to be able to work on data visualization projects, read business printouts, and work on digital media such as video and audio. Many journalism students are already doing this work, so it makes sense for schools to create new study programs. And so those students who were inclined in that direction ended up taking a lot of interactive graphics, design, data viz, and coding courses. And so we, we started to see graduates who we, you know, had no question belonged in the world of STEM. Northeastern's new program joins other journalism programs at schools like New York University, the University of Southern California, and the University of South Florida that have a STEM designation. At New York University, the school also lists drama therapy and psychology among STEM-designated programs. At one point, the U.S. government was worried that OPT was taking jobs away from American workers. However, once President Joe Biden's administration came into office, the chance for international students to do two extra years of OPT actually increased. In the STEM-designated degree program list released in January 2022, several new study areas were included. The new study programs include forestry, data visualization, psychology, business analytics, animal behaviors, and research methods in social sciences. Un-Q Lee is a business and marketing professor at Syracuse University in New York State. He said, international students who want to work in the U.S. should look for STEM-designated programs when they are searching for colleges. People may think that business study programs, such as marketing, do not require STEM skills. But Lee said, that is not true. There is a growing emphasis on the importance of data analytics. I mean, you can imagine that each time you make a call or visit a web page or use your mobile devices, just a huge amount of data are being accumulated. Data, Lee said, is of great concern to businesses. So students with STEM degrees have an advantage when it comes to finding jobs. And then, because of the extended OPT, a student might be able to find an employer who will help them get a work visa. I'm Dan Friedel. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. The world is filled with many interesting places. A map helps us find them. 
any place you need to find a street address, business, famous landmark or park is most likely on a map. Which brings us to our expression, all over the map. We use this expression in several different ways. The first way means to be spread out over a great distance. For example, years ago I drove across the United States by myself. I was all over the map on that trip through mountains, deserts, forests, and more. Here is another way we use this expression. All over the map can also mean having many different kinds of something. For example, if a restaurant offers a variety of dishes from many different countries, you can say its menu is all over the map. Here is another example. Washington, D.C. is a very international city. People from all over the map live and work together in D.C. Here's another example. If someone asks me what music I like, it's hard to answer. I enjoy listening to many kinds of music, from rock to classical to soul and country. You could say my musical interests are all over the map. Or another example. My favorite international store sells a little of everything. It has coffee from Brazil, chocolate from Belgium, soap from France, and tea from Japan. But you can also buy fresh vegetables. That store is all over the map with its products. Finally, we also use the expression all over the map to mean confused or unfocused. If thinking, speaking, or planning is unorganized, we can describe it as all over the map. This expression can also describe a person. If someone is all over the map, they could be having a hard time focusing on one thing. Here's an example. My coworker Karen led a very confusing meeting. First, she talked about plans to move the company overseas. Then she switched to sales estimates for the next season and later budget cuts. Her presentation was all over the map. Nobody had a clear understanding of the project. Another project I worked on was set up to fail. The directions the designer gave to the team were all over the map. The builders did not even know where to start digging. And that brings us to the end of this words and their stories. I hope our expression was clearly explained. This is not the time to be all over the map. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. Thank you, Anna. And that's the Learning English broadcast for today. Our program certainly took you all over the map from Asia to Africa and the U.S. Thanks to my colleagues, Andrew Smith, John Russell, Katie Weaver, and Faith Perlow. And thank you for listening. Be sure to join us again tomorrow to keep learning English with stories from around the world. Visit the Learning English website for more. You can find us at learningenglish.voanews.com. I'm Dan Friedel.